in your social feeds this morning, did you come across a few headlines that sound something like this? 10 tips for running a successful business. Six management hacks to increase workplace motivation. The eight habits of every successful leader. Now there's comfort in these leadership listicles, but I'm here to break it to you. They're nonsense. The truth is, there is no magic list of principles for workplace transformation because leadership is not about magic. Good leadership, I believe, comes down to a science. As a chief behavioral officer, I'm on a mission to transform the way executives think about motivating their workforce. You don't need a degree in psychology to lead like a scientist. You just have to be open to experimentation. Start by taking a look around your organization. There are scientists all among us. In developing our products, we test like scientists. The randomized controlled trial is a hallmark of rigorous product development, exemplified by the careful drug testing of the pharmaceutical industry. The only way to know whether a new treatment works better than a placebo is to test it accordingly on a random representative sample of the relevant population. In building our strategies, we plan like scientists. We use big data and econometric models to chart the waters of our investments. When deciding whether to venture into a new product category, we do our best not to guess, but to leverage the data we can find. And when it comes to understanding our consumers, we are the most scientific of all. Brand managers wouldn't dream of launching a new marketing campaign without testing it first. And digital marketing has made standard practice out of A-B testing, with email campaigns and websites constantly tinkering and optimizing to maximize clicks, views, and conversions. At any given moment, Facebook is testing over 10,000 versions of its platform. When it comes to our consumers, we leave no stone unturned or untested. Indeed, science is everywhere in the business world, except where we need it most. When it comes to our employees, at the front lines, talking to our customers, building our pipelines, selling our products, are we turning that microscope inward? Are we leading like scientists? There's a lot at stake here. If we consider compensation alone, each year, US firms spend $800 billion on our sales forces. That's five times what we spend on advertising. We also spend vast sums of money on non-cash incentive, rewards, and recognition, adding up to an enormous collective investment in performance and retention. Not to mention the tremendous costs we incur in sick days, reduced productivity, and lost goodwill when we mismanage our approach to employee well-being and engagement. Now, if I were to ask you, how do you motivate your workforce? Do your programs work? How do you know? What would you tell me? I'm sensing a collective shrug. That's right, it's time we start leading like scientists. So what do I mean by that? How can leaders be like scientists? I'll share a few lessons I've learned from my experience at the intersection of scientific research and management practice. First, Scientists know that humans are not computers. We are not rational, economic, utility-maximizing machines. Scientists know that the psychology of motivation is not as simple as a straightforward, do this, get that, linear relationship which suggests that more money produces more effort which leads to greater performance. The relatively recent boom in behavioral economics and social psychology research shows us that People are influenced by a host of non-conscious factors that affect how hard we try. Cash is not always king, and more is not always better. Humans are more complex than that, and we should adjust our approach to workforce motivation accordingly. Take cash, for example. We all need it to live comfortably, and there is no substitute for fair compensation. I am not suggesting that anyone replace paychecks with foosball tables and ice cream socials. But beyond fair compensation, when it comes to motivating discretionary efforts, to going above and beyond the bare minimum, it turns out that cash is surprisingly ineffective. Now, that's not to say that people don't like cash. In fact, we prefer it, and we tend to show this preference in research settings when we're offered a choice between a cash reward and a non-cash reward, like chocolate, gadgets, uh, spa certificates, or travel. When offered a choice between a cash reward and a non-cash reward, we tend to choose the cash, because cash is a sensible choice. You can use it on anything, after all, especially responsible things like groceries and utility bills. 
But psychologists are finding that preference does not necessarily lead to performance. In one study, participants were not invited to choose, but rather were randomly assigned into either of two conditions, a cash reward or a non-cash reward, and they were put to work. These working adults were invited to complete as many word puzzle tasks as they could in a set period of time. And the more they produced, the more cash or the higher the value of the non-cash reward they earned. The researchers then compared the lift in performance between these two groups. Now here is the kicker. The participants in the non-cash reward improved their performance significantly more so than did participants working for cash. Now what this study and many others like it suggest is that while we think we want cash, assuming our needs are met, we actually work harder for non-cash rewards. Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company found this to be the case when they offered one group of their salespeople a cash incentive and compared their performance to a similar group of salespeople working for an equivalently valued non-cash reward. Again, they found that salespeople working for the chance to win a non-cash reward improved their sales by almost 50% more than did salespeople working for cash. Perhaps most surprising is what happens when we give cash awards away entirely. In this study, with pharmaceutical sales teams, psychologists gave one group of sales reps a windfall cash bonus to spend on themselves. But they gave another group of reps an equal-sized cash bonus to spend on someone else on their team. And what they found in this group of generous sales reps who were given cash to spend on someone else went beyond that warm glow feeling. They actually found that sales teams whose reps were given cash to spend on others sold more prescriptions the following month than those who were given cash to spend on themselves. So what this suggests is that spending our cash on others not only makes us feel good, in some cases, it might even make us work harder as well. So people are not so straightforward. We're somewhat irrational from an economic perspective. And for the scientific leader, tapping into this rich psychology of motivation and reward can truly unleash the potential of your workforce. So where do we go from here? Well, my next lesson is that scientists are curious. They challenge the status quo and try new ideas. Think like a scientist, try something new. Let's start by asking ourselves, why have we always done it this way? What would happen if we let employees choose their own goals? Or sponsored a carpooling service for more social bonding time? How about offering imaginative rewards like social experiences, more time off, or the chance to donate our sick days to peers who may need them more than we do? Or how about just letting people wear shorts to work? Big or small, it's a good idea to try your new ideas. Even small changes to the workplace environment can have outsized effects on employee behavior. So what might you try? If you have a hunch, you have a hypothesis. And that brings me to my most important lesson. Technically, scientists don't just try things. They test them. They run experiments. Just as a clinical researcher would run a series of randomized controlled trials to test the efficacy of a new drug, so too can executives run experiments to empirically test new management concepts. If you have a bold new idea for motivating performance in your workplace, or even a minor change that hasn't been done before, Testing first is a good way to limit your risk and be more confident that it will work in your organization before rolling it out at scale. I'll give you a real example of an experiment we ran to test a new idea for motivating performance. The head of sales for a large automotive manufacturer had a big idea. He was thinking of changing his retail channel incentive program, which rewards dealers for hitting their targets at the end of each month with a substantial cash bonus. He was thinking of changing the timing of these bonuses from the end of the month to the beginning of the month. He thought we could assume these dealers will hit their targets, give them that respective bonus amount in advance, and tell them, this is yours to keep or lose. If you hit your sales target, you keep this bonus. If not, we take it back and try again next month. Now, this is a clever idea. First of all, the dealers might appreciate this signal of trust and investment from the manufacturer not to mention the advanced cash flow. But also, this could be immediately beneficial to the manufacturer. You see, this sales leader was moonlighting as a behavioral economist. Scientists know that people are loss averse. 
That means that it generally feels worse to lose something we have than it feels good to gain that thing. So it stands to reason that dealerships given their bonus upfront at the beginning of the month, thus faced with the threat of losing that bonus, might work harder and sell more vehicles than dealers hoping to earn that bonus later. But could we be sure? Not exactly. This idea of the lost contract had not yet been tested in this environment. And the automotive dealership landscape is complex. The incentive programs, even more so. So it would not be prudent to assume that the lost contracts would work in this setting until we test it in this organization. Impressively, this executive decided to lead like a scientist. So we turned his idea into a hypothesis and set out to test it empirically in a randomized controlled trial of about 300 of their dealerships across the country in one of the largest corporate field studies ever conducted. For half of the dealerships, we changed the timing of their bonuses from the end to the beginning of the month. The dealers were clear on the rules, and in cases where they missed their targets, we did indeed take those bonuses back. For the other half of the dealerships, everything remained business as usual, payments at the end of the month based retrospectively on whether or not they hit those targets. We ran this experiment for four monthly cycles and then compared the sales performance between the two groups. What did we find? Did the lost contracts make dealers paid up front at the beginning of the month sell more vehicles, working harder when faced with the threat of losing their endowed bonus? Let's see. This is the change in sales for the dealerships experiencing this lost contract treatment. Sales increased over 2% in the four months of running the experiment. That's pretty good, right? It looks to me like the lost contracts made sales go up a little bit. But not so fast. We actually can't be sure what effect the lost contracts had on sales until we compare this change in sales to the change experienced by the control group. Remember, the control group of dealers continued to receive their bonuses at the end of the month with no change at all. Ah, the control dealers actually experienced a lift in sales of a full 6% over the same four-month period. And that's a substantial difference in unit sales of almost two and a half vehicles per month. Now, in this experiment, this gap is what we care about, the difference in differences. By comparing the difference in sales growth rate, we are able to see that the lost contract made sales grow less than they would have had we done nothing at all. In other words, they backfired. Surprise. Now, there are four, a few really important takeaways um, from this. First, it's so important to see that without a control group, we would have missed this effect. If we had just run the lost contract on all the dealers without a control group as a point of comparison, we would have thought the lost contract is lifting sales by 2%. We would think that it's working a little bit and we'd still be running this intervention today with the firm potentially missing out on potential sales revenue. This is why you need a control group. But why did the lost contracts backfire in this case? This is utterly fascinating from a behavioral science standpoint. Basically, the lost contracts work like a bright red siren on the targets, making the goals loom larger or feel scarier than before. By dialing up the stakes of hitting the targets, introducing this threat of loss, we caused a bit of an overreaction. So dealers in the lost contract group, for the few of them who were just on the cusp, they did manage to eke out a few extra sales to get over the finish line. But for the dealers who were too far away from their targets, or for those who had just hit their sales targets for the month, they tended to take a step back and start focusing on next month's sales or on selling other brands instead. And it was this increased gaming behavior that on average slowed the growth in sales of the lost treated dealers. This effect on gaming behavior was a truly novel and crucial insight for incentive design, which we can then use to optimize programs like this going forward. So there's a lot to nerd out on and important insights to contribute to management theory. But the immediate benefit of running this experiment was a practical one. What this leader needed to know was whether this idea was a good one for his program. And running an experiment which compared the new timing to a control group continuing with the old timing was the only way to know for sure. By leading like a scientist, he was able to try a promising new idea while limiting his risk to a pilot group and a bounded window of time. He learned what he needed to know quickly 
before making a sweeping change in policy. So my biggest lesson for leaders is this. Don't just do it, test it. And tell us what you learn. My final lesson for leading like a scientist is to publish your findings. Human behavior is not a trade secret. Share the, with what you learn with the world, especially where you're learning what works, to help people flourish, to be more inclusive, and to find joy in work. Businesses have the scale and power to make a difference in today's society, in which we spend over a third of our lives at work. Showcase your thought leadership and innovation. Be a hero, or be discreet and anonymize your findings. Just do your part to make the world a better place to work. Thank you.